podcast. I know, I know. I've listened to a couple of them, but I seriously think you should get a jingle. Okay, I, I can That's you have my suggestions. Um, well, you, no, I'm no good at actually coming up with the jingle. <laughs> if you are listening to this podcast... <laughs> That's what people listen for, uh, Joel. Slacking. They're always tuning in for the jingles. Do, 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 they don't really do, care about what you have to do, say. Do, do. Okay, it's a Stack Exchange podcast brought to you by Stack Exchange. Episode, now I don't know the episode number. I think it's 27. Thank 27. <laughs> it is. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Our guest just <laughs> wrote the show. Do I get, now wait a second. Okay, this is the first time I'm going to ask this question, all right? Sure. How many points do I get for that? Seven. Um, Seven. All right. Hundred. <laughs> Seven hundred. Because we have to get, let him get to a million by the end of the show, right, Joe? I, I, I can give I you points. I knew what episode number it was. That ought to get me some status on Saki Street. Uh, I can give you points on, let's see, how about coal mining technology? No, we don't have a coal mining No, site. I don't know anything about coal mining, I'm afraid. <laughs> I don't and know it, if you get programmer points for that. How about RSS? That's about it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Our guests... Uh, um, uh, I guess our guest today is Dave Weiner, who is the inventor of in, in sequence. Let me see if we can get this in order. No, don't use the word inventor. We're going to get in trouble if you do that. Oh, whatever. Uh, pioneer. You, of... you know, it's hard to be an inventor because you don't, the inventions don't happen the way that they happen in movies. Yeah, we should talk about that. There's not these things don't get invented. Right, uh, right. Yep. There's always there's always sort of like the ideas in the air. Somebody puts prior it down. Art. Well, it's also prior art. You're building on the ideas that other people had. You know? Right. You don't right. want to invent things. You want to make it you look continuous. For yeah, for, yeah. So that's what the one that I remember the best, which is probably not on your Wikipedia page, is XML RPC. Yeah, well, which is now uh, forgotten. Well, but actually, it's not at all forgotten. It's not by my me. number two site. Oh, in terms of traffic, <laughs> scripting news is number one. So but. XML had come out, and it was a standard way of describing of of let's say serializing a data record of some sort. Yeah, and. Uh, and and the idea had just started to emerge that you could use HTTP to get kind of a, a remote procedure call on another server instead of using any of these uh, hard, hard bound, like what did we used to use? I mean, it was sockets. You would open a socket to the server and the server would have a whole lot of shenanigans. And then you would pack all your data structures using... Um, Using your network library to decide what the byte order of your integers should be. This is your story, right? Yeah, this is my story. Okay. This is before we had XML or RBC because right. I think the problem was that if you wanted to write a server for any purpose, yeah. you had to start from scratch writing a server. Well, and that's not my story. All right, tell me your story. My story is I was a Mac developer, and we had just ported our product to Windows. Mm -hmm. That was vanilla. No, this is Frontier. Uh, Frontier. This is before Manila. Right. Frontier was the database that Manila ran And the ran scripting on. environment and editor, the runtime environment. Yeah. And um, we had ported it to Windows. And on the Mac, it, the applications people were building in Frontier were mostly networked applications because the Mac had good networking. Mm -hmm. um, and it had an API called Apple Events. And Apple Events worked over the local area network. And oh, right. so That's now we ported it yeah. to Windows. And now we needed a way to do the same kind of networking on Windows that we were doing on the Mac. And, and distributed com was... <laughs> well, yeah. well, we took a little look at it and said, I think we can do this a little easier. Plus, we didn't want to be bound into a vendor because that was a nightmare on, on, on sure. Macintosh. Apple was always changing the APIs. And, you know, it was like we were spending all the time just keeping up with them. Yeah. And so, yeah, Com had that problem. It was a binary. There was like a binary API, and you couldn't really do it if you didn't have the libraries from Microsoft. So well, as long as you were on Windows, good, this is a good DLLs. story, though, Joel. It's a really good. I mean, um, yeah. So I T just us. had this idea, okay, that we could just do the XML over HTTP, and that would be our PC. So I wrote a blog post about it, of course, right? Mm -hmm. And then I get a call from a friend of mine at Microsoft, Bob Atkinson. Bob Atkinson. And, um, and he said, you know, how funny that is, because we're thinking about doing exactly that sort of thing. Would you like to work with us? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, of course I would. And, and we did a collaboration on it. It was probably the best collaboration I've ever done in my life. In two weeks, we had XML RPC. And it was just one uh, page somewhere. And I implemented it right away because yeah, I needed that exact thing. 
Yep, it takes very little time to implement. You could do it yeah. in a weekend, pretty much. I could prove, and you could prove that you've completely covered it. You know, whereas soap, which came later, <laughs> which was derived from it, you could prove. I could always prove that your stack was not complete. That there was something <laughs> you could have. I don't care how many years you put into it. Right. We could show that you there could was do some it, time zone which error. Which is, of course, you were making. why the the big companies loved it, is because they could claim to be interoperable without actually having to be interoperable. <laughs> <laughs> it was the best of both possible worlds. <laughs> so that's the story of XMRP. Right, XMRPC was the early version of SOAP. The, the way I saw it was that if you need to implement a server that a client can call and get services from, there's certain things that in those days you had to re-implement all by yourself. Yep. So basically figuring out how you're going to serve multiple well, clients we're right back in a there now. way. It's that way again, because that's what REST is. REST is you have to invent yeah. your own serialization format. There is no standard there. Well, there's starting to be JSON. and Even that, that's no more of a standard than XML is. Uh -huh. It doesn't tell you how to serialize a structure of data. It doesn't tell you how to do it. So you do it for yourself, and you don't get to reuse code. Yeah. Uh, Alex, I think Dave is cutting out a little bit there. Can you lower his squelch? Do we have a squelch knob for him? Nope. <laughs> I'm cutting out. You move mean closer I, to the. Uh, just I don't want to move closer. <laughs> Bring the mic like, closer to you. the way I am. <laughs> All right. He's not really can... cutting out to me, Joel. Oh, really? Nope. He's only cutting out for me. Well, I'm uh, sitting right across from you, Joel. Well, so. now we have to cut out all of this. <laughs> Why? From, from the, the podcast. podcast. No, oh, this is what podcasts know, are all about. I know. This is what podcasts are all about. Okay, so XML RPC is, uh, was, was, was awesome and beautiful and elegant in its simplicity. Thanks. And it was REST before REST, uh, except that it specified more about uh, the exact format. I mean, it told you exactly how to transmit a date. It told right. you how to... Um, there yeah. was some... I don't know. There were some, I guess there were some minor ambiguities. Like nobody in those days understood. I, I was motivated to finally write the Unicode article that I wrote because I discovered that everybody read the spec and said, oh, it's plain text. And they didn't think about encoding. And so all the problems that you had were encoding errors in yeah, those days. Yeah, because I didn't really understand. When I wrote the spec, I, I was... Nobody did. Yeah. So, I, years well, later. Thanks. That's nice. Because there were people who said they did. Yeah, um, I'm not sure few. that they did or they didn't. But. People were full of it. I just remember somebody somebody said to me, uh, you know, we have these customers in Japan and they want to know how to send an email in Japanese. And I said, wait, they have email in Japan? And it literally, <laughs> I was like, that probably doesn't work on email because email is asking. asking doesn't work. They're and not allowed I, to have that yet. I, we, we haven't given them permission. I, I read the entire SMTP spec, and I don't remember any way of sending Japanese in that spec. It was pretty clear about what an ASCII letter is. Well, and, it's annoying. I yeah. mean, why do we have to support that, too? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I, 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 did, I finally figured it out years later uh, how it's all supposed to work. But um, uh, okay, so then and then SOAP came along, and that was a big, very bureaucratic version of XML RPC that was basically only understandable, only usable if your compiler generated all the proxies for you. In other words, if you didn't have to do any work, you just had some really awesome integrated development environment that lets you take a, a class interface, and it would sort of generate the SOAP endpoints for you. Then it might have been usable. Okay, I, you know, I mean, it, it's not worth arguing over. I mean, uh, I found that we could use it as long as we stuck to a profile St of it. Stuck to a minimum yeah. subset. We, yeah. yeah, but it's all ancient history, and, and nobody wants to write soap apps today. Yeah, yeah, that and, sort of yeah. disappeared. So there was that. There was RSS, uh, blogging, podcasting. Yeah, now and, RSS is uh, blog, OPML. That's not OPML, clear. yeah. We should talk a little bit about that, actually. Okay. But later. We don't have to talk about it right now. <laughs> Let's talk about what you want to talk about. I, oh, well, I, I, don't, I don't care. I'm, oh. I got you here. I want to talk about everything. Okay. What are you working on, Dave, right now? Um, well, I'm working on a magnificent symphony of software. <laughs> yeah. It's huge. It's, um, it's meant to be the communication. It's the communication system that I want to use. So it's got minimal blogging tool. It's got three big components to it. Uh -huh. a minimal blogging tool. That means it doesn't do rendering. It's only output is RSS. Interesting. Okay. okay. So, you know, we're going to make pieces that are, you know, small pieces loosely joined mm -hmm. so that the interfaces are pretty simple. And then, you know, people can replace components. So minimal blogging tool generates RSS. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, hanging off that are little things that gateway the RSS into various different places you want it to go that don't support RSS. Ah. Like Twitter, for example, does not Im import RSS. So there has to be a little dongle there that says, okay. And that's, that's actually what 
personally I want is to connect to Twitter, but I don't. But I want to generate RSS first, right. so that everything I generate can be reused in other environments. I don't want to bind myself into Twitter. For a long time, I was just doing development on Twitter, uh-huh. uh, but I don't think that's advisable anymore. So that's, <laughs> that's well, they break the developers. I mean, we're, we're in that yeah. point in their life where they're not they even like ashamed break. of doing it. They do it all the time. So yeah. that's a good time to develop a little insulation. Um, second piece is a river of news aggregator. So that so, reads in multiple RSS feeds yeah, from lots of places and right. shows them to you. In reverse uh, chronological order. With, it's very simple. And, and river of news means that it's uh, interspersed so that you're not looking at one person's feed at a time like yeah. you do in Google Reader. That's right. Uh, you're, it's more like Tumblr or Twitter where you're actually seeing things in chronological order yeah, no matter where they came from. That's actually a really good definition. A lot of people have trouble understanding. They think that Google Reader does the river of news. And yeah. I've, you know, I've kept an open mind every time I ask them, you know, show me how this, that's not the river of news. I mean, the whole idea of the river of news is that you can navigate just with a scroll bar. Right. That's all. I mean, I, and that's important. That, that's a level of simplicity. If you tell me that you can do something like that, but you have to stand on your head and hit this thing while you're hitting the, I mean, they can do something roughly like it, <laughs> but it's not going to work. I don't want to do all that work, and I don't want to explain that to anybody. Why don't we just make it simple? You know? And that's the key point was what you said is that uh, it's all interspersed. You're not reading one feed. It's, I, you know, it's the impulse of news. I want to know what's new. Yeah. That's it. You know, and Twitter is absolutely a river of news. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Uh, Facebook, not so much. Facebook, no, Facebook is, is more complicated. Totally. Yeah, because yeah. they're, they're, they're trying to decide what to show you That's and what right. not to show you. So uh, I'm not sure I want them to do that. They have different motives I, than I, I do. I always find it kind of scary. I, I, I'm like, am I going to be missing things from the people I care about yeah. so that I can read things from the people that I don't care about? That make them because, money. You, you know, or, <laughs> no, or because they just made a bad decision. You know, they they seem to... You yeah. know, they, 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 they have a little bit too much faith in the algorithm's ability to pick what you want to see. Now, it's interesting that we parse this making. differently. I'm not running a you know, company like you are, you know, and so you would probably not see anything wrong with them choosing things. They do, come on, they do choose things that make them more money, right? Uh, that, that's, when they, they sit down and have a meeting at yeah. Facebook and somebody says, well, we shouldn't do this because this might be seen as making us more money. They have a good laugh, right? <laughs> I mean, that's why they go, well, yeah. okay, great. Use that in your speech. But, I don't, Dave, I don't even think they're sophisticated enough to figure out how to make money by choosing what to show you. They Actually, might be on the ad side. They are. On the advertising side, they are. No, I do. I think they, well, I heard a story. Eli Pariser told the story at a conference I was at. Eli runs uh, um, moveon.org, uh-huh. and he wrote a book about this stuff. And uh, he tells a story about how they studied the behavior of Facebook users, men, uh, like to see pictures of their women friends. Right. And if they see a picture of the, their women friend, uh, of a women friend, they'll come back for two weeks. Oh. Okay. So <laughs> so then what they do is that they notice you haven't been logging on. They send an email to your women friends. They don't tell you why they're asking. <laughs> so, well, come on, put up a picture. We really like to see a picture up there because they want, you know, the other the guy to come back. You know? Okay. Somebody yeah. writing this down, but somebody it, from Stack well, Exchange. Wait, but in fairness, <laughs> isn't that them giving people what they want? Well, how, how, they're not directly making money off it. I didn't say there's it. anything immoral about it. Yes, <laughs> okay. they are directly making money off of it. It's, it just may not be the algorithm that I want that them you to use. use. I come in right. there for news, if yeah. if I were coming there for news. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying this. They're a company acting like a company. Well, what, right. duh, right? I mean, that's what you would think they would do. But that isn't what I want when I want the news. I right. want news, and I want to let it sort of happen. No. So uh, uh, every time I hear um, somebody saying, I, I, I want to generate the RSS first, well, I don't hear that. This is the first time I've ever heard that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Whenever yeah. I hear somebody yeah. saying, uh, I want the content to be sort of the standalone naked content, and later I might want to flow, flow it to Twitter, Foursquare, Tumblr, blog, and R- RSS, and Google Plus for all I care. I don't really care what all those sort of output parts of the streams are. I just, I just generate the content, and I'll shoot it into all of my little mm-hmm. streams. And I feel like that goes against Marshall McLuhan. Uh, the medium is a massage. The medium is a message. In other words, if you write a message for Twitter, 
it, it's got to be a different kind of message than the message you would put on Foursquare or the message you would put on your Tumblr. Well, I don't use Foursquare, so I don't know what that kind of message is. That's just is. checking in. Right. Like, here I am. Yeah, that's why I don't use it. I think that's boring. And but, it is very boring. Yeah. <laughs> just my opinion. You I, know? I, I, for one, don't get But uh, take, for example, Tumblr. If you no, look at Tumblr. No, but I'm very familiar with that argument, and it, there's a flip side to it. And, of yeah. course, there's validity to it. Um, and there are certainly circumstances where you don't want to do that. Like I had a Twitter feed connected to Facebook, and nobody complained, but I got a chance to see what it looked like. I said, "This is ridiculous." This there is was uh, there was a particularly uh, uh, bad example was the deal between Twitter and LinkedIn, um, w- where I, I guess LinkedIn gave you LinkedIn decided to try to compete against Twitter because they had social networks yeah, yeah, yeah. and the and so they said you can hook up your Twitter and your LinkedIn feeds. And the engineers came, came up with this idea that you would take your Twitter feed and have that duplicated in your LinkedIn feed. Right. And so now when I look at a LinkedIn feed, um, there are only two kinds of tweets I see. People, t- tweets that I've already seen because I care about those people and I'm following them. And, and therefore they're boring and they're redundant because I've seen them. Like right. Neil Dash, already saw it in Twitter, don't need to see it in LinkedIn. Right. Or tweets from people that I am not following because their tweets are boring. Right. Because well, I don't care to follow their tweets. Okay. And so, by definition, everything in the LinkedIn feed is but annoying Joel, to me. Joel, it's still a good idea to have the feed, okay? And this is why. Yeah. Because what I want, ultimately, is these companies out of the loop. I don't want them defining the context for my writing. Uh-huh. And it's it's not just that I don't want them to do that. It's that I'm not, not, not letting them do that. I, I am no longer... I mean, it's just wrong. They, so they, you... You they want to create the abstraction layer above all these people that I like have, to deliver. I have. Yeah. And for me, it, it works great. And I think that at some point in the future, people are going to want this. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's not yet, but um, I don't think that the publishing industry has figured out yet that it's really bad for them to be very dependent on these technology companies. Or yeah. as a medium, they're not a good medium. You know? Oh, they're in right. Congress right now trying to eliminate their well, dependence on a technology companies. Well, I understand. That's <laughs> no, I'm not thinking about those. Yeah, right. Well, okay, that might be a that might be a lesson for them, right? Is that you know extrapolate? I'm thinking about the news companies. That's all I ever think right. about. Really, is I'm a news guy, you know, uh-huh. through and through. That's the way I look at the world. Um, but I want. My content to my, I want the things that I create to have an existence. I want to take care of them, right? Because I don't trust the companies to do that. You mm-hmm. know, um, your company might be a little bit better than most, but I still, if I were writing a lot of content for, you know, Stack Overflow, right? You might, I you would, might want to keep it. I want, yeah, I want it to yeah. be on my server, right. and and have it be on your server, exactly as if it had been written there. So yeah. that people read it, it feels exactly like it. I don't want a loss of fidelity over on your side of it, but I don't want to give up the, the responsibility for archiving it, maintaining it, and collating it amongst my own collection of writing, because yeah. I care about that, right? And so, uh, you know, if you puzzle this out, there are certain things that just fall out of it, is that you need to have, for Twitter-like services, you need to have something like RSS, because RSS and Twitter are really very close cousins. Yeah, they're very similar, um, but for things like Google Plus, yeah, it's probably not going to work, right? But I have blog posts that fit, would fit very nicely into Google Plus. Yeah, and again, I'm not going to put my content over there, and I think p- that people are going to tune into that. Maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but at some point, a lot of us are going to want to have our content somewhere else in one one place that you control. Yeah. And those guys are just who who does the delivery. You don't care what channels it goes through. Maybe I do care, but I still want the control. Yeah. Okay. In other words, I you don't, don't want to give it to on. Google because I don't like Google, right? Yeah. So I don't want to give it to them. You know, I they made it. They made a deal with the Chinese government. I don't like that. I don't want to give it to them, so I don't give it to them, right? But maybe I do next week want to give it to them, maybe. right? Or maybe I want to give them this piece, but I don't want to give them this other piece, right? So what you want is a hot link connecting the content. Also, I want my changes to percolate. So that if I make sure. a change to the document in the original place, I want it to percolate to the other place. Right. And so what you've got is like a different kind of linking. It's it's analogous to the linking that you have in the web, but it's a, it's a richer, deeper form of linking because the content actually is made present in the other location as, as opposed to just being pointed to by it. Mm-hmm. So that's the third item. So you've got the 
RSS, minimal blogging tool, you've got the river of news aggregator, and the third one is this sort of, sort of overarching tool for creating content that can be picked apart and included in other places, and it's built for that. And, and this, it's still your content on your server. That's right. Yeah. A, a, absolutely. And it, that, one's, I've been, that one I've been working on for at least 15 years. And <laughs> it finally works. <laughs> How do we get it? <laughs> oh, well, if you want to use it, of course. how did you? Is this? Did you build this on? Are you still building on top of uh, the Frontier database? Yeah, yeah. That's so, what I built. Frontier is yeah. the my you know goal when I when I started building it was this is going to be the programming language I'm going to spend the rest of my life working in, uh -huh. and it turned out that way. Well, you're not dead yet. Dave. <laughs> I'm not dead yet, but I'm I'm getting there. Yeah, I'm along. You know, it's like I'm not a, I'm not planning on like you know switching to it. <laughs> well, I, it's working out. I'm still in my life, right? Yeah. Now. So, yeah. So, so Dave, I saw you deleted your your Facebook account. Yeah, I sure did. And that, that goes effect on November 23rd. You don't yeah. seem to me like the kind of guy that's going to decide to opt out. No. That is that is clever though. You know how Facebook doesn't actually delete. When you say you want it to leave, they're like, yeah. okay, we're going to hold it for two weeks. That is true because we have had a, f a handful of Stack Exchange users that decided, oh, I want to delete my account, and then later came back. Yeah. This has happened a non-trivial number of times. <laughs> Absolutely. And what a pain and in it, the butt that is, right? Yeah. Somebody says, yeah, well, I deleted my account in a huff. You know, this is called slamming the door on your way out, right? And of course, they, they it's blame hugely obnoxious. you for it, too. Even yeah. though they did all the action you warned right. them, they blame you for so, it. So uh, Facebook came up with a perfectly reasonable approach to this, and... Yeah. No, uh, I'm not going to change my mind. Absolutely right. not. No. Well, another thing that strikes me is a lot of the rules you're you're defining really only apply to people that are creating content. Yeah. You know, and I would also slightly take issue. You call yourself a news guy, but reading, I went through and read sort of the, you know the front page of scripting news, and really you're more of an an analyst. I wouldn't say you're just reporting the news. No, I, I'm not reporting the news. I don't so think I am. Yourself and I quote a news guy. That's no, not, from, as a developer, I'm a news guy. Oh, In other words, those are the systems that I, that's what I think of. you care about. Yeah. I mean, some people are like privacy experts, right? And they would never develop the kind of software that I develop. My software, don't put anything in my software that you don't want blasted all over the world because that's the way my software works. Mm -hmm. It's all right. about blasting, right? So, uh, yeah, but no, I mean, I'm not a news guy in the sense that I don't, I'm not a reporter at all. Right. I, right. I am a, a guy, you know, I'm a blogger. Right? Well, this is things, what a blogger does. I mean, one yeah. of the things I liked about blogging was this idea that people could report on stuff that they actually knew That's about. The, see, there you go. That's the <laughs> because point. Because they, they, they had the first-person point of view instead of third-person, I and guess. That's really what news is. In a way, that's what news is all about. News yeah. is about aggregating expertise. It's about pulling it together and turning it into a story. And so you need lots of experts, lots of bloggers, and then, hey, you don't need reporters so much. I mean, reporters' jobs change quite a bit. Yeah. I think you guys are doing a really interesting job. You know, your work is uh, is part of this whole thing too. I mean, you're creating a knowledge flow. Sure, could be applied to news just as easily. Well, it probably I mean, is in some context. That might be interesting. Yeah, mm. I mean, why not? Yeah. I mean, it's the same fundamental idea. People have a question, they need an answer to it, and they're trying to draw the expertise. I don't agree with you, by the way, that the uh, that the your your customer is is not the person who asked the question or the person who answered it, is what you said in the last podcast. Um, I think well, it's more, it's like the whole sea of people is the, are the people you care about. You can't do it without the expertise, sure. well, right? But well, actually, we, let me, let me clear. Actually, Joel, I know what he's talking about. Yeah. I can clarify, because this is part of my um, Ordev presentation, was that there's really three layers to this cake that we're baking. And the first layer is indeed the selfish layer of, look, I have a problem, and I need someone to help me with my problem. That's level one. And, and I, I say to people all the time, nobody should care more about getting an answer to your question than you do. Nobody in the world should care more than you do to the point that like you should go out and sort of bust your butt to get the answer by any means necessary. I agree. Like, keep updating your question. I mean, it's this is really rude. It's rude to ask a question that's easily answered, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, and we've covered that as well. It's like, how much work did you put into the question? That's yeah. that's the asymmetry of, oh, I asked a one-sentence question and got a 10-paragraph <laughs> answer from right. a person who spends his life doing this. You well, that's how I deal with comments on my blog. If, if I don't think your comment reflects some thinking or some knowledge or an alternate point of view, I don't let it in. 
Yeah. It's not there. I don't want it. You know, it's people just... get very territorial about that. They think, okay, this is mine, <laughs> and you can't delete it. And I go, yeah, I can. And if you don't want, if you don't like it, write a blog post. And there, I can't. You know. your... But those guys are spamming anyway. I mean, that's the whole. This is a form of spam. Dave, I take it even further. I didn't never had comments on my blog. Yeah. Um, because at one point you said, if you have an opinion, go write it in your own damn yeah. space. And I really like that. I really like that idea. You got to be a hard ass. Yeah. You know, right. Yeah, well, that's and how I want blogging, people to have their own space that, if they're that, saying interesting things. Blogging, that's how the blogging community, first blogging community got started, was basically people were just flaming. Yeah. So I shut the we comments didn't have, down. We didn't have comments for a long I, time. I had discuss.userland.com, uh -huh. and that was ancillary to scripting.com. That's right. And the two, and for the first year, it was a miracle. I mean, just like it was so collegial and... Everybody was yeah. so polite and whatever, <laughs> and then the usual thing happened, right? Yeah, that is sort of funny. Some asshole showed up, and then all of a sudden, it's not fun anymore, right? It's the and, combination of that people realize that there's a big audience there, and well, that's it. And then you're starting to get spam, right? And, because that's uh, what they're doing. People are assholes because there's an audience. Yep. Yeah. Like, some people need well, to show that off. Also, about themselves. this is why comments are really second-class citizens in our engine. So yeah. really you have, okay, you have questions. That's the big unit of work in the system is, okay, you start with a question. And then the whole point of a question is to eventually have an answer. So answers are, if in many ways, more important than the questions. The question yeah. is the seed that we call it the, the oyster that creates the pearl. Yeah. You know, and the pearl is indeed the answer. Uh, but then you have comments. And comments, we've said for a long time, are, are really ephemeral. Like they can be removed sort of at will. Like answers are much more protected than comments uh, because comments are sort of like metadata. They're, yeah. they're commentary or something. We call them like post it notes that you put on a question or an it answer. might be like did you didn't you misspell this thing and the comment would go away as soon as somebody corrected the spelling ideally but then you have people that will complain it's like oh my god you you modified history <laughs> yeah you know it's like well no this is a post-it note this is like oh what about x right. and then you update the question you click edit right this is a wikipedia style thing right click edit and change the question or answer and to then the comment the information. is no longer relevant it's, it's over it's moot well how do you avoid the i mean wikipedia is a mess i mean i I've tried adding to Wikipedia and have never actually succeeded in doing it. I mean, you know, I, I, and, I, and these are things where I don't have the conflict yeah. of interest. I don't, I'm very careful about that. I don't write. It's sort of problematic. I, I, well, there, was a, there was a terrible accident. I used to live in the Bay Area, and there was a terrible accident um, on the MacArthur Interchange. And I happened to be in the area and had data about it, and I went and added some of that data to it. I was the first guy in there. Five minutes later, it's all reverted. It's like citation needed. <laughs> it's like I was there. <laughs> yeah. well, I, we're going to give you a citation. I actually saw the thing happen, you know? I think that, well, that like, one of the weaknesses of Wikipedia is that they still believe some of the, mm -hmm. uh, some of the encyclopedia rules, things like notoriety. They're like, this is not important enough to belong in an encyclopedia. And this is the internet. We'll make more pages. We don't. It doesn't have to be that important. You can make a page about. Yeah, they argue you want. about silly things sometimes. Yeah, yeah. and I, th I I think that they're still clinging to several things like the citation needed and the notoriety are a couple of examples where I believe that they're probably clinging to things. I think this is more just, old fashioned. Uh, this territorialism. This guy who owns yeah. that page doesn't. doesn't okay, want he doesn't know. He doesn't want. I, I don't know. I have no idea. You just can dream about what I it is. I always think it's, it's funny. The one Wikipedia article I contributed a lot to, uh, and I was the only person that, I guess, knew about the founding of the kibbutz that I founded. And uh, so I wrote uh, the article about the first few years of this kibbutz, um, and I'm pretty sure it's okay. And what's funny is the kibbutz finally got a website. And in their history section, they've gotten pasted from Wikipedia. Yeah. Because they don't even know their own history at this uh, point. Well, we've had, there have been some them. really funny stories about folklore about people who put themselves into stories on wikipedia <laughs> and now they it's can't big. be taken out because this has been cited the reporters have taken this and it, taken so it and re they repeated it and now it's all over the place this guy yeah. you know was the third guy who did a project that you know he wasn't involved at I mean, least there's some hope of tracing this you know in the old days the same thing happened except it was scribes writing and scrolls which went in right. libraries they did the same thing probably well that's see okay so now that's that's why, you know, I'm so concerned about – I don't think any of these companies I mean, are very concerned about preserving the archive, right? Mm -hmm. But we're, as a society, doing a really terrible job of that now. And the digital archives are, are not – Yeah. They, they what? It's hard. It's, and it's getting it's worse. It's hard, yeah. And, and, and so if we want to have anything remembered about the times we lived in, yeah. 
we need to start thinking and about this and working on uh, it. The easiest way to tell is just go back 10 years and look at an old scripting news page and yeah. all the links are broken. That's right. Like literally. Hey. It's, it's almost and, – and, and the interesting thing about a blog and relying on hyperlinks is that a, a, half of the material is in the links. Like the, the – a, a, a typical, even some of my blog posts can't, which I try to, I used to write them as essays uh, that I hoped could stand alone. But I mean, they had substantial parts of their content were what was I linking to when I used the word X? Right. Well, I think we need to come up with some best practices for this, some mm -hmm. things that we've learned, like fewer domain names is better. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I've learned because uh, you, you, it's just hard to manage all those different domain names. That's how I lose most of my content. Is you know yeah. I don't renew some domain because I think oh I'm not using that you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> turns out I was using it for a while but you know I just forgot it you right. know so uh, and static pages for sure you know uh, well Dave one point of tension there is that people aren't as individuals I think if you look back to, pick an average blog post from ten years ago and if you look at the, the sort of the type of links that get broken the ones where you say okay. And I agree with you for the record that, you know, as a writer, you want to be responsible for it. You're right. You want to curate it. You want to be, you know, making sure it's available on the web. But people kind of suck at this. Yeah. You know, like they'll decide, like uh, Mark Pilgrim decides he doesn't want to be on the web anymore. He pulls everything he's ever created off the web. And people are kind of unreliable. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed this. Well, okay. See, that's – I'm just – yeah, I agree totally. And um, – but until we have a way to just sort of delegate this – and buy a service from somebody who's more reliable than people, what choice do we have, you know? I mean... Well, I think those services would be of interest, but you could make a case, and I, I don't agree with this, but you could make a case that Facebook is such a service, that Facebook, yeah. statistically speaking, is going to be more reliable than Joe's random house of content. I don't agree. You know? I don't well, agree. Well, I mean, it's just people, though. It, it, you just ah. don't know, Jeff. You, you have no basis for making that statement. I mean, if you, w if you were to look at history you would not come to that conclusion. I mean, Netscape would have been the equivalent of that of, uh, what, 15 years ago? Where is all of Netscape's content today? I mean, GeoCities might have been that. Yahoo yeah. might have been that. You have a whole series of companies that come and go. Companies are very ephemeral. Um, you know, I think I would trust the university more. The university... Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, universities but, have this problem in, on a huge level, yeah. enormous level, and they don't have a solution to it either. And the academics are like, I've been to a few academic conferences on this, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't think they're thinking about it pragmatically yet. I think that we, you know, I think that we would do better if, from an engineering standpoint, we started to approach this problem. I think this should be brought up because it is irritating. You know, the web is this fantastic resource. But outside of stuff like Wikipedia, um, and even GeoCities was mirrored, right? GeoCities was big enough that when it was shut down, Did somebody you know, grab it? the guys at archive.org uh, went through and grabbed it all. Well, why you don't know? you guys start a program and say, look, every bit of content on Stack Exchange is going to be protected in this way uh, for the future. Make a deal with some organization, some a academic institution, the Library of Congress or something. Give them some money to do it because you're going to have to pay. F somebody Somehow this is going to have uh -huh. to be financed. Uh, you know, let's work on the problem. I mean, this is a good place to start. You guys are generating a, yeah. we, a lot I mean, of we started from a legal perspective of making sure that all our content was Creative Commons, uh, which we did to protect ourselves uh, against what happened to um, IMDB, CDDB, and uh, Experts Exchange. What happened? We uh, in all three of those cases, user-generated content was somehow fell into the hands of an organization that wanted to start making money off of it. And so content that had been generated by the community was suddenly privately owned. Um, so IMDb the originated. Paywall goes up, the paywall goes up. Right. Now, IMDb didn't really put up a paywall. CDDB did, yeah. and Experts Exchange did. But IMDb, uh, you know, just became a commercial Amazon thing. Uh, but all I know the content, people with CDDB. And yeah. The good people there, not the bad ones. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was a mess. Right, right. And it just seems sort of unfair. This is all user-generated content. They should Absolutely. in some way. Uh, but that's only protecting on – that's the other side you're protecting on. Well, we yeah. felt that if we don't put the – mission, not only do we put it on community commons, but, I mean, we make database dumps available every month and put them on BitTorrent. It's every, uh, like, three or four months now, Joel, because oh. it's so much work. <laughs> it's, but we, we do do that. We, we yeah. dump it out and we put a torrent out of pretty much all the data in our system. Uh, and, and the idea was we wanted people to and, – and, 
even if we hadn't done that because it was the right thing, we had to do that from a pragmatic perspective just to get people to trust us because we were entering a marketplace in which some bad players had basically done a bad thing. That's great. And, and we I had to say. Wonderful. I'm not just saying that either. Yeah. Right? You know, it, well, the, the whole the whole premise of the network is again, yeah, it's a trust thing. I mean, and I totally respect what you're saying, Dave. It's like when when people come on Stack Exchange, they are becoming authors in some. See small now, way, Facebook right? hasn't done that, Jeff. So when you say no, not at all. you trust Facebook, in fact, they're quite the opposite. Sure, they make they they not only do they make it difficult to get your content off there, but they throw a lot of. BS at it to make it sound like you can, and in practice you can't. <laughs> Did you hear about this European uh, Privacy Act thing where you can demand in Europe, apparently you have a legal right to demand that a company reveal everything it knows about you. And so Facebook has some deeply hidden page that you can get with a court order where you fill this thing out saying, I want all the information about me from Facebook, and they send you a CD-ROM <laughs> with just a dump of everything they have on you, which is literally, you know, every IP address you ever logged on from, every, every single... Every time you poked any person going back to 2005, <laughs> Wait, it has pokes? Yeah. Oh, they oh, literally damn. record oh, data. Every, <laughs> that's it. I'm every doing that button out. you've ever clicked <laughs> oh, it's, on no, Facebook. No, it's worse than yeah. that. It's every page that you've ever been to on the web yeah. that has a like button in it. Yeah. yeah. That, was the, that right. was the thing that made me decide I didn't want to be on Facebook that, that anymore. Very, that oh, and they creepy, were tracking scary. you after you were logged out. That's right. Yeah. 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 Just in case. <laughs> well, They're real... <laughs> Yeah. Mavens there. Well, they, but, well, hold but, on, hold on. Google I can look too. at pictures of my female friends on it, so I don't want to delete. <laughs> Google probably does. It's just a bad, almost Well, certainly. one thing I have noticed, let me, let me just tell you a story. I do think, I don't know, I agree that that's weird from a privacy perspective, but I also think that it can be used for semi-good, because I've noticed for some reason that Google has gotten really good at serving me targeted ads for stuff that I'm actually kind of interested in, like dramatically better of late. Really? Like, well, yes. Yes. And one thing, for example, Joel, and I think it's yeah. because they know somehow I'm a developer, but, like, they'll target me with, like, Twilio and stuff. Well, you know, we that, had, uh, uh, not on Google, but on the ad networks, there's a thing. I can't remember the name of this ad network, but it's a company that tracks what websites you've been to and shows you ads for those websites that you've already been to after you've been there. Uh, I don't like that, but it's a little eerie, to be honest. Like, I've noticed the ad targeting has gotten, in the last six months, way better. Yeah. And one way you would do that is if, okay, somehow there was a like button, which is an image, which it goes back to, say, Google or Facebook, then they implicitly know that you've been there, right? Because that request came from you, and they can sort of sync that. Sort of the magical GIF, GIF tracking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think, uh, jo Jeff, you're talking more about, yeah, their, their, their profiling has gotten really good. Joel, I think you're talking about ad retargeting. Where retargeting, that's what it's called. they're taking that. But no, they, they're overall just profiling, like, because they know what sites you're going to. They've figured you, and they're reading your email. Um, they, they, know, you they know you really well at They'll this point. They'll also show you an ad for a search that you did a while ago if those, yeah. ad, if those ads are more... Um, cost effective or are more profitable to them yes. than the ads on they your current search. They will show you completely irrelevant ad ads to your current search. <clears throat> and uh, you know, and just to play devil's advocate here, I'm not. I don't want to be the guy who's arguing in favor of the ad networks because that's crazy. But it is actually a slightly better experience for me as a user to see ads that aren't ridiculous. That you care about. <laughs> yeah, that I true. give a crap about. Yeah. Well, and know, people that. forget that sites do have to make money. Like, someone's got to pay to keep the servers up. <laughs> oh, God. That, <laughs> that old saw. It should, look, you can either pay for well, the why content. Why do I care about that? I'm not, I don't care about that, okay? I'm willing to pay Amazon a certain amount of money every month to host my content. Uh -huh. Now, why do I care? Ama that I know then, sure, Amazon, I know how they make money. Yeah. yeah like, well, so with that old saw is like, that's, re you know, fine. They need to make money. I'll pay the money. Yeah. Except most that's, people won't. And well, you can see that in freemium models. Most people will, all right, like, what, 0.01% yeah. of people will pay. Well, well, let's, well, let's go back to friction, though. That's friction, Dave. You have to go out, make some kind of contract with somebody, remember to keep it updated. Whereas most people, like if you contribute to the Stack Exchange Network, for example, we'll protect your content, like we'll make your creative comments, but we do reserve the right to serve ads with it, like relevant ads. I mean, that's part of our contract yeah, with you. That's sort of, I, and you get that for free. You don't have to think, right? You're like, okay, I trust these guys. These guys right, are somewhat. So you guys are outnumber me. You have to let me respond, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, okay, great. So we can never make these things easier, and we can never make it fairer, and nobody could ever abuse that in a way that might get people so angry that they might want to actually do something about it. You know, I mean, we have not, we, we're really vulnerable, and a lot of nasty stuff can happen. That means it's going to happen, all right? And, um, you know, I don't accept the argument that things that are hard have to always be hard, you know? So if it right now, it actually isn't that hard to set up an account on Amazon to host your content. It actually isn't 
part at all. And I've and I run you mean into like a Amazon Web Services where it's hosting your S three your server. Okay. S three. Oh, okay. This Explain is what you have to storage. do to set up uh, yeah. an S three account. Um, you have to, you know if you're already buying, you know your Cheerios or your underwear on Amazon, <laughs> you actually you have the account. You, you actually need. have the account. Okay. <laughs> So you just have to go there, and then it works pretty much like a file system. <laughs> so, all right, now I know a lot of people can't use a file system, but a lot of people can, too. Uh-huh. And, you know, I, 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 I discovered this by, you know, starting to evangelize this to some of my friends who are not that technical. A few of them said, what are you talking about? I'm already using it. And then, you know, I saw the software they're using, and, yeah, it's pretty easy. It's not hard. I also wrote a, um, a tutorial just to see how this would work called EC2 for Poets. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that I think that if you're a reasonably technical person, meaning like you know how to back up files, uh, you know, you you can manage your own computer basically. I think you can set up a server on EC2. And so I wrote the tutorial and I hacked at it and iterated over it and the answer is yes. You know, this is the revelation people have when you show them how to set up a server. What they learn is that a server is just like a laptop. You know, it's no different. You so, can, uh, what, what I'm, I just want to clarify something because uh, some of the people in the chat room are confused. You're talking about publishers essentially, and you're saying it's so cheap and easy for them to publish by just using S. Um, not S3 really. No. That the the. Not well, limited business, to that. Not limited to that. You're a publisher if you use Facebook, right? You're putting pictures sure. on there. You know the rationale. What we were just talking about. You know, you guys were saying, well, you know. It's too hard to do this. That's why you use Facebook. And if Facebook screws you, that's okay because, you know, you're getting a service for free. They have to make money somehow. All this, like, you just took (laughs) me in a circle (laughs) that had me believing that it was okay to get screwed. And I never believe that it is. I'm a New Yorker (laughs) in my soul, and I don't believe that. I think that we, you know, I just, I'm so appalled by the level of support that I get from the computer networks that I use these days. Yeah, and so much of it is a computer it's network. Free. Well, not all of it is free. I had a Kindle Fire de- uh, uh, delivered to me today, oh, but yeah. unfortunately, I moved since placing the order, oh. so it went to the wrong place. Right. I realized it was going to the wrong place a week ago. Amazon couldn't help me. They said, "Well, when it ships, try to get in touch with UPS and get them <laughs> to do the right thing." Well, they have a website that not. says, "If you give us all your information." Then we'll do this for you. Yeah. Well, but you have to wait until the delivery fails. <laughs> sure. And okay, so I wait till well, the delivery. It's not, it's, not, it's not magic. It's not like they have a computer. I wait till the delivery fails, and then the website says, "Now we're trying to figure out where you live." Yeah. And I'm going, "I know where I live. I can <laughs> tell you that it's already gone back to Amazon. It's over." All and these are just the irritations. How about when somebody hacks your account? Yeah, and that and the company isn't. Really... I was thinking about that because one of the ways, I mean, and I don't mean to uh, hijack the conversation a little bit, but the reason that you can get a, an Amazon Kindle Fire delivered to you on the day that it's created to your exact address for two hundred dollars, and it's Pretty this amazing, amazing piece it? of yeah. freaking technology that's like how many Cray supercomputers worth of. Worth of I, <laughs> I'm not complaining about <laughs> that. I think it's wonderful the times we live and in. And you get brought to your house for no extra charge. And the reason that you can have it flown through the air, 30,000 feet. I don't want to go into the Louis C.K. routine. The reason you can have this is because we have cut every possible corner. And one of those corners that we cut a long time ago is dealing with the 1% exceptions. The person who moved, yeah. the person who actually needs their thing delivered on time. I had to go to a wedding, and I had a tuxedo delivered by FedEx overnight. And it didn't get there overnight. It got there in two days, and I was in trouble. And, uh, and, and FedEx was just incapable. But our freedom... Of- no, it does come down to freedom at some point. It's predicated on the rights of the minorities. Uh-huh. Okay? So the very same arguments that say that it's just the 1% outlier, that you don't have to worry about that. When yeah. you apply that to freedom, then you have a serious problem. Y- you, because, uh, yeah. yeah, you do. I you mean, sure. yeah. and, um, and so that's the world that I'm worried about. That You know, I want to have an intellectual remainder from our civilization. I want something to be left after we're done that it's not just all consuming. I love 
what you can get through. I mean, I love that you can go to seamlessweberdelivery.com yeah. <laughs> and press a few buttons food and a arrives. few minutes food arrives and you're eating. You know, it's great. <laughs> that was actually in uh, looking looking backward, that utopian book by Edward Alamey in 1888. Edward Bellamy wrote a book. Did he predict that? Looking backward, yes. And, <laughs> and it was it was seamless. It was like we, we touch a few buttons on the console. Literally a 19th century utopian book, and the food is delivered to the house, so so nobody has to cook by themselves. See. I uh, think that's great. But we want also the messy parts of our society to work, too. Part, yeah, that, and, that is a part of the problem, is that the reason yeah. all this stuff is affordable and the reason that even, um, you know, you can build a four-bedroom house in the desert of Las Vegas for $50,000 that's a palace uh, and it can have a swimming pool is because uh, we've cut every possible corner and the stuff is really crappy. And it's okay for most people. And when it starts to not work, uh, we, we don't really care. And if we had to provide that level of customer service. You know, a, a great example is Google Docs, where you might be paying $25 or something for what used to cost $300 to get Microsoft Office. And uh, the difference is, and the, and the way Google makes that affordable is that they just don't have very good tech support. So they just do not help you with your problems. There is nobody to call. They're starting to catch up a little bit on that. I understand, uh, and that's okay. You know, but it's when it's the, you know, these guys also do deals with governments and Facebook mm -hmm. wants to get into China and China yeah. does not have a good yeah, record no. of freedom. Nope. And if they want to get into China and China says you need to curtail free speech in the United States, they might do that. Yeah. Because they have board of directors and the I, board I of directors. I think they're just wrong to want to get into China. I'm sorry. I just, I. But I'm that's not for you to, to decide, right? That's yeah. their decision. Yeah, but I don't think I, it's not going to. Facebook is not going to. It's not going to work. All these all these internet companies that are like, how do I get into China? They're not going to be able to compete there. There's not the money. Founded by someone in China. That's yeah, right. yeah. In yeah, is to is to be a native Chinese company. Otherwise, they're just selling the farm and they're not really getting the profits. That yeah. They, I don't know what they think. They also execute a lot of people in China, too. That's how they keep everything working. I feel like Google was in this awesome position, which I think they've sort of used, which is just to say, listen, you need us more than we need you. It's like, you, fine, you don't want, you want to have a great wall of China? Great. You're going to discover that this makes it really hard to do business in the world. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll teach you that lesson. Well, the espionage part of that story was fantastic, where Google sort of made a little bit of a deal where they became a little bit evil, right? <laughs> <laughs> And, I, and even I was like, oh, you know, that's not really cool, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, you know, Dave, I've said for a long time that I think it shouldn't be don't be evil. That's not enough. It should be always be good, right? There's a weirdness of don't be evil. It says, okay, you can go right up to the edge of being evil, but just don't go over. <laughs> and I'm like, this isn't right. Just don't be completely <laughs> evil. Yeah, you can it's do like a few you should, evil things. Your motto should be do good. But anyway, I just thought it was awesome that this espionage story came out of where basically somehow basically Chinese nationals were, were basically hacking Google from the inside, right? And like this is what you get. It's like you lie down with dogs and you get fleas, right? Right. And this is this sort of thing. Like don't go there. This is what Joel is saying. And I think Joel has a great track record of sort of in business and, and, and also you can see this in Stack Exchange with, with Fog Creek and the earlier stuff is trying to protect people in this relationship. Even people that aren't good at protecting themselves, mm -hmm. you know, when you're in engaging in this relationship, uh, you sort of, uh, it's almost like you need it like a marriage counselor, basically. It's like you're picking a relationship. Is your relationship going to be with Facebook? Is it going to be slightly abusive? <laughs> no. I mean, all these relationships have trade-offs, right? It's like, do you trust the other entity in the relationship? And I don't should want you that. Trust them? I, I don't want that at all. I want to buy a service. Have it be very bland and uninvolved in my life and do it. But yeah, do a good job of providing the service. Amazon, up until the point where they knocked WikiLeaks off their server, yeah. that was ideal. And now <laughs> they introduced a lot of doubt about their viability as being a platform for, for, for journalism. But for, if you're yeah. only using them for storage, then they're, it's interchangeable, so you move. Where, so you where would I move to? Exactly. <laughs> oh, actually, I mean, there are implementations. There are open source implementations of the S3 protocol. I know, but I'm not looking anywhere. for the implementation. I'm looking for the whole package. I'm looking for <laughs> the uptime and the reliability and the backing up. And I've decided yeah. to overlook this one for okay. the moment and say, <laughs> okay, I'll just keep using. And I'm going to try to almost pretend that didn't happen. You know? <laughs> but I, in my back it's, of my mind, I know it's, it's really But Jeff, off. I don't want to get married to these guys. I, you know, it, I, my phone service. I finally got that straightened out. You know, after trying, you know, AT and T and Verizon and all the rest of it, what I have now is a month-to-month -month 
uh, T-Mobile. Yeah. Yep, and an unlocked phone, which I paid six hundred fifty dollars for, and I like it a lot. It's not as good as my iPhone, but I but I can completely control it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that means a, a tremendous amount to me. And I think that's the way that service should be provided. Getting being married to those people was a terrible thing. They were they were really awful partners, and I don't think any of these companies are any good. You know. So, so, yeah. Let me cover. So you had a, you had an entry called "Will users always be users?" Yeah. And the money quote here is: If you're not paying for something, you have no reason to expect it to be there tomorrow. Yeah. But sort of the unwritten thing you're not saying here is is just because you pay for something, doesn't mean uh, you can even expect it to be there about either, it, brother. I mean, yes, it sucks. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so w what works? It's like I think you have to have a coalition of users. Like I think people like you, David, if this is something that that's important to you, and it sounds like it is, there needs to be sort of a coalition of of just common people that yep. band together to form this nonprofit organization. I think Wikipedia is probably the closest thing. Well, there were you know Aren't there were there some companies that we like to do business with. Sure. Like, can now, you have, I think you can trust what? any companies, now including us. Ultimately, I mean, I don't know. That's tricky. I mean, you how remember, far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? You well, can there are trust some... them to a degree, though. It's that look, they have your interests. You have you have your interests, and like ninety percent of the time, your interests will align because if you you being happy is in their interest, but oh. then like ten percent of the time, you're gonna conflict with them, and you just need to know what that ten percent of the guy? time is. This is producer Alex. I know, but Alex, it, I, he's supposed I, to. He's it's supposed to sound like he's shouting from the other side of the room. Hello. Can I just say naive beyond belief? Sure, I mean, he's like 20 it, years it, it, it doesn't work that way. It just simply doesn't work that way. When they have my interests don't enter into it at all. I mean, and, and they're incapable, usually incapable of understanding my interests. Anyway. You know, I'll give you a case in point. Somebody hacked my phone. Mm hmm and uh <laughs> wait a minute that's because you got one of those phones that you can install anything on no right? no 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 i mean <laughs> oh. they, they they got my account information oh, okay and um they started changing passwords and things like that uh -huh. on the account so i tried to close the account and the hacker opened it again <laughs> and yeah it wasn't funny <laughs> from my point of, awful. and then the problem is is that the company you know in your model the company would be have my best interest at heart well maybe they did but they didn't understand this idea that somebody hacked my phone yeah. And they couldn't deal with it. Whereas my credit card company, who I don't particularly like, yeah. if I called them up and said, hey, somebody's hacked my credit card, before I finished the sentence, the card would be canceled. Uh, right? They yeah. would know how to do that. I could not get this company. It took, it took a month and a half to get them to finally close the account. Right, right. That's fairly interesting. Um, it's, it's, it, well, the, problem uh, the credit is, card company is financially, by federal yeah, law, is financially laws. liable but for the charges. Right, whereas, and they're uh, good at it. They're on the yeah. It's, it's their, their business. Well, right. They, it's their money yeah, on the, the line. It's their money on the line. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me let me interject with one other thing. When I read the book on uh, net neutrality, I don't have the title in front of me, but one of the things that struck me was that the only thing that can protect you from business is government. So then you're sort of in this this ethics dilemma of do I, do I hate businesses more or do I hate government more? Because really, yeah, once businesses get to a Democrats certain <laughs> once you get to a certain size of business, like literally, they're, they're so powerful, they have so much money, they can pretty much do anything to anyone that they want. Yeah, it's the same thing, right? I mean, there's no difference between business and government anyway, right? They, but, but they they do counteract each other, though. If you look at the history, and I he, don't believe that. Well, I believe book, that today makes a, are they the same thing. He makes a case for it. I mean, you can agree or disagree with the historical evidence, but he uses history. He provides evidence that government does intercede, uh, but sometimes in the wrong direction. Like sometimes government is influenced by business. Huh. Government is business. These yeah. guys, there's no, there's no line separating them. You know, I don't think that's always true. But uh, what do you think these people are protesting down the street from here? <laughs> I'm not really sure. No, that's what they're protesting getting kicked out. No, no, that's what the issue is. The issue is is that uh, there is no line of separation. Everything, uh, uh, this is, maybe we're like deep in a hole here. I'm getting people <laughs> saying that the cliche, oh, you should stick to talking about technology. No, no. Yeah, yeah, well, what to which I say what? is, that's not why I started blogging. I didn't, yeah. start so that you could tell me about. what to talk about. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, uh, this is about technology, Dave. This yes, is about you it being is. an author. This I mean, is I one of the reasons totally I like reasonable. being a I know, but we're so far apart that it's that that it's the conversation. We are far apart. We are. I mean, so to re try to resolve it in a podcast, it's kind of hopeless. I mean, my my belief is that there is no 
line of delineation between the government and the corporations. Well, one of the things to bring when back a, to when technology. When a company has a complaint, yeah, they they manipulate the government to solve the problem for them. Uh, it, right well, now, that's but we don't have the ability to do that. That's the difference. Um, I wait, can't okay. have a policy with a company that says I don't allow you to do this. Okay, that's no. You have to click OK and check the box. Or you, or, or, you or, they, or do no business. You don't get the product. Yeah, yeah right. So, I mean, but one of the things I want to bring it back to technology because one of the things I think Dave you would advocate for and what you're building, the tools that you're building, kind of remind me of the old email systems where there was no single controller, like old SMTP email, where li- literally there was no single vendor and nobody could stop you from sending email to someone else. And the web is like that too, right? And the web was yes. like yeah. that, right? It still is. There's net neutrality. Yeah. That's and we, and we had those systems, and, and uh, this is what we, we love built, about the web. It's, we haven't yeah. built a lot of those systems lately. We've built the the big things that are starting to take over more right. and more of our online time are Twitter, Facebook, um, even chat services, where you're always on some corporate site doing things their way. I mean, Twitter. There's no reason Twitter couldn't have been built as a peer to peer protocol. It doesn't need. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, it could have worked exactly like RSS and blogging. There's no, there was absolutely no reason for there to be a single company. So what's going to happen? And Tumblr. So what's going to happen is at some point you're going to be able to deliver features with the open syndicated system that you can't deliver on the closed system, and people are going to want that. Yeah, if, that um, if we don't get there, then it'll never change. That's, uh, it's that simple. Right, right, right. And that's, by the way, how the web, you and I were around at the transition time from the pre-web to the web. That's the difference that's what the web it was harder to use it was more complicated and had more esoteric technological bumbo jumbo yeah. that you had to master but the freedom was so it, it, it could do things that the other system couldn't do sure that people wanted to do and that's why it happened yeah and so that that's that's my belief is that it's worth trying these the ideas out. stuff does still to see where we get. You see new peer to peer ideas that, that show up like uh, BitTorrent like and OpenID, for example. The Open Joel Hubs. <laughs> because it's so easy to use. Let's talk about but identity no, no. for a sec. Can we talk about identity for one minute? No, no, sure. no. Have to. Well, okay. I think DNS is the answer. <laughs> what? DNS. That was what OpenID tried to do, right? Is be a well, you just DNS have to hack case. at it. You have to hack its simplicity. Uh, That's what all these things are about. You have to find out why, figure out why. You know, take the steps out of the process till it is actually simple. Mm-hmm. Open ID got mired in politics before they could do all that stuff. Same thing with RSS, by the way. I mean, that why is Twitter kicking ass? Because they solved the subscription problem that RSS has. Uh-huh. You know, RSS. Wait, uh, let me think about that. Twitter solved the subscription I'll, problem. I'll explain. I mean, yeah. you know, you're looking at something. You see, the thought forms in your head. I want to subscribe to this or follow it. There's always a button that says follow. Right. Now, in RSS, how many steps do you have to go before you actually have achieved that? Oh, geez, you got to look for the little orange icon. It's ridiculous. (laughs) It's utterly ridiculous, okay? Twitter, you click a button and you're done, Uh right? That's it. That's the reason why everybody loves Twitter. Yeah. Right? That's why it boomed and RSS sort of plateaued. It also, now, I I, I just have to solve those problems, that's all. It's something about the, the... um, the the medium in which RSS was carried, i.e., blog posts, and just the way it was portrayed, encouraged long long form stuff, and Twitter encouraged, you know, enforced short form stuff. Right. And I think I'll, people generate a lot more content if they feel like they only have to generate a sentence or two, and they're only allowed to generate a sentence Most or two. They, they have is, to sit down and write an essay. Isn't worth reading. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> that's a different kind of content, but I mean, that's what made it take off. It's a lot of people platform. chatting at each other, you know. Yeah. Sloganeering. Uh, sure. But, I mean, I'm always – there's certain things that I'm always willing to sloganeer, and I'm not willing to sit down and write. <laughs> but you are talk. a writer, Joel. Right? I, you used to be. <laughs> you don't write it? I don't write that much anymore. No. I don't uh, – That's disappointing. I'm thinking of resuming it, but I, I'm sort of uh, kind of busy these days. <laughs> Good writer, man. It's a uh, shame to lose you. If that's... Well, thanks. I was thinking of writing fiction. Oh. Really? How do you write fiction? It's much easier than writing uh, is, is nonfiction. Be of Super, Taco? <laughs> Super Taco, my dog. No, it's going to be uh, – I don't know. The thing about fiction is that you don't have to tell the truth. You can tell the truth, the, the deeper truth, for like what's really going on by manipulating the superficial facts to meet the truth that you want to actually tell. You don't have to have uh... a... There's a funny example that in the, in the Jobs biography, apparently Mona Simpson, which is his sister that mm-hmm. he met later in life, wrote a book that was basically about Steve Jobs but in fictional form. Oh, really? Did you know this, Joel? No. 
Yeah, one of her books is pretty much. I mean, it's it's supposedly it's like you know twenty percent reality and eighty percent you know like you said manipulation of reality, but it was just weird to hear about that many years after the fact. Yeah. Well, I think you should be writing. I would like you to write. Oh, Alex is Alex is making signs that we're we're done with this. Do we even announce a podcast number? This has been podcast twenty seven. Yes. Is that it? Podcast. Remember, he knew what podcast number it was. That's you it. did it. Well, I, how many points do I get for that? That's I told you seven. Oh, seven. That's nothing. Seven. How many points? Okay. How many I, points do you get for doing the podcast? How many? You know, I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm gonna go find something you wrote on Stack Overflow. If there's about. only kind of been points. if there's only been twenty seven podcasts, it seems like there ought to be a lot of points available here. <laughs> Uh, wait, you don't have any points. <laughs> okay. Look at all these answers you wrote. How come you don't have points? I oh, you have so. 523 every day. Yeah, I'm not doing too bad, but all right. I only write it. Uh, uh, whatever. I'm just I'm upvoting you. I just gave you 10 points. What ticks, Done. What ticks me off is when I, more points. when I answer a, a, a question and then somebody decides the question wasn't a good question. Yeah. <laughs> There's a certain amount of... Uh, that I uh, don't like. Well, one of the things that we like about Stack Overflow is there's a certain amount of randomness in the allocation of points, which keeps you coming back, because it has been psychologically proven no. that intermittent reinforcement is stronger reinforcement than reliable reinforcement. No, I don't mind being a hamster in your case, in your thing. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 you have good about. rewards, and it's understood right up front that I'm a well, hamster, right? <laughs> right? I mean, you might as well actually use the iconography of a hamster, you know? <laughs> it's a like a little, spinning uh, little thing, right? Have a trail or a Absolutely. little spinning thing that you can run I'm, around in. I'm not opposed to it. Just be up front about it, you know? It's like... We always are. That's what's really interesting is, is and, and that is kind of what happens, is that there are people participating in the site, and they feel like they're getting a lot of value out of it. But the outer layer of the cake is that really 95% of the value in the site is people later on coming and reading the, the history of what happened and getting answers to their questions that, they, that somebody had already asked. Right. But the incentives have to, well, yeah. I, I, I can't see it being any other way. Of course it's that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well, I think so, you're doing a great job. Thanks. Jeff, too. I think you guys are fantastic. So are you, Dave, well, and you're you. obviously and, and Dave, inspirational I, to us. Let, in, let me take Dave's side here for, for one second. It's like, I yeah. really believe that this sort of coalition of the users doing stuff together that aren't influenced by Facebook and Google, we need to keep that alive. Like, Let's I think do it. You, I'm open. Well, you, I'm totally open for that. That's awesome. And I think you should continue lobbying for that. We should continue lobbying for these companies to be you know, fair. Like, and, and in addition to that, if even if they aren't fair, like, like Alex's point about, oh, ninety percent of the time you agree, but that ten percent, pretty Boy. much they hold all the cards. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's the point. That's the problem with the ten percent. Uh, we need to put power, at least have alternate systems where the users can do all this stuff without being under the thumb of these companies. Well, um, we should I, get together and have like a dinner or something next time in California. Or you 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 live in El, El Cerrito, right? Yeah, Bay Area. I lived in Berkeley. Oh, for yeah. quite right, a while, right yeah. down the street. Yeah, right down the street. Uh, yeah, I'd love to continue this conversation. I mean, this is actually the conversation I'm having all the time. You know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> it's basically what I do. So, cool. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much. For the, those of you that don't know, first of all, Dave, I also I should thank you on the air, just because I would not have started blogging if it wasn't for editthispage.com. Awesome. That's uh, great. And your inspiration. You and really I don't helped. think I would have even started Fog Creek if it wasn't for just your blogging about Userland. Oh. Uh, and uh, it was it was two people. It was you and Phil Greenspun blogging about Ars Digita. Oh, yeah. um, and you were blogging in enough detail about how things worked that I believe that I could start a company. I mean, nowadays, all you have to do is go to Hacker News or something, and you'll find millions of people telling you how to start a company. Um, but back then, it just didn't exist, and I, I would never have known where to start. Um, so Great. I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for, uh, for, uh, well, that's for you. That's really – that's one of the marks of a great man is that you know where – you know. Yeah, I, I mean, know who. Most taught, people taught, don't taught. don't bother yeah. figuring out how they got there. And so, geez, yeah. we're doing a podcast today, which of course you and uh, Adam Curry were some of the early podcasters, yep. if not the inventors of the format. We don't like the word inventing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's exactly. dangerous. No, no, it's absolutely true. These things are never invented. That's They're a just, third uh... rail right there. You know, <laughs> we try to stay off it. Thanks like, so much, Joel. Like I really, really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks for being on. Um, to our listeners, uh, you can find Dave at Scripting News, which is scripting. Dot com, which is actually at this point a kind of a historical name, but you still script all day long. And, I do. Yeah. And the other one I mentioned was Poets, EC2 for Poets, and that's poets.scripting.com. Poets. So if anybody wants to try that, I highly, you know, I'd love to get the feedback and if there are any problems with it or you see ways to improve it, it'd be great. Cool. And we'll have links to all this stuff in the show notes at um, blog.stackexchange.com. Um, those of you listening live, uh, we'll, this will all be up along with the recording tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern, and next week, Chris Poole, moot, hopefully, right? No, week after. Week after. 
Ah, who's on next week? <laughs> TBD. TBD. We don't know who our guest will be next week. It might be Actually, I should say my dog. Secret. We have a secret. Ooh, that's a good nice. remote. That's the right distance for you to be from the microphone. No, I'm not going to stay <laughs> Only when you talk. All right. We'll see you all next week on a very boring Stack Exchange podcast. Thank you. Thanks very much.